Diplomacy is the, the business of engaging with other governments on an official level and with their citizens uh, on a more uh, interpersonal citizen-to-citizen -citizen, uh, level and working with international organizations, multilateral organizations, working together to try to uh, frame solutions to challenges that, that are important to us and are important to other people. And that can be uh, a matter of um, issues related to education, to culture, to health, uh, to building stronger economies and better trade relations. I mean, it's as broad as life, really. It's all the things that people engage in at home here in the United States, but it's uh, a matter of pulling in the, uh, the partners and, and sometimes the people who are not necessarily our partners, but we may need to work with them anyway to resolve issues in their regions. I grew up here in Washington, D.C., and while I was still in high school, my mother worked at the Department of State. And so that was when I was learning more about what the State Department is and what it does. And I can remember that she commented to me one day that I should think about working at the State Department, think about the Foreign Service. She said, these are smart, hardworking people. They're doing important work. They're fun to work with. It's a great place to work. And that was my experience. I worked at State every summer while I was in college. And I, I never came across anybody who was sorry that they'd made the decision to join the State Department team, whether they were Foreign Service or Civil Service. Consular services are uh, part of the, the work of diplomacy. And the uh, one important element of it is uh, protection, uh, assistance to American citizens overseas. That assistance begins before people travel overseas because we provide a lot of information about uh, safety and security factors uh, in every country around the world, things that people ought to know so that as they make their travel plans, they can plan uh, in, a, in a wise way. And the way a person takes the information that we provide, which we try to make comprehensive and accurate and up-to-date, uh, how they use it is going to depend on their own background. If, if you are, for example, a person who has uh, lived and worked in Austria and you speak German and you have friends and colleagues there, you're going to read it differently, what we have to say about things to look out for in Austria, than uh, someone who has never left the United States before, doesn't speak a foreign language. So we want our information to be something that people can use uh, uh, and travel safely. But once you are overseas, if you run into difficulties, for example, if you're the victim of a crime or if you have uh, some sort of a, an accident and, and that uh, injures you and lands you in the hospital, if you are arrested and charged with a crime, if you are uh, destitute, uh, there are lots of different things that can come up uh, that, that uh, affect people while they're traveling far from home. And they may not know exactly how to cope with uh, all of the elements of that in the same way that you would know pretty well what to do if you ran into an emergency when you were here in the United States in a city that you had never been in before Still, you know how to use the phone system, you know about 911, you know how to communicate with your insurance company. You may not know how to do all those things when you're serving or when you're uh, traveling or living overseas. We help people to register to vote. We uh, assist them with uh, registering the births of children that are born to them overseas so that those children are documented as American citizens. We provide assistance to American citizens who are interested in adopting foreign-born children and we uh, provide information about how the adoption process works in different foreign countries. And we also work with the governments of foreign countries to help make sure that the, uh, the process is, is transparent and legal and straightforward and as rapid and efficient as possible. Because if a child needs a home, that child needs to be part of a family as soon as possible. You don't want it to be a process that, that takes months or years. Um, we also work in, in terms of the protection of children specifically to assist families in cases of parental child abduction. 
we have thousands of cases of those at any given time. And this, these are cases where one parent has taken the child or the children and has fled across uh, an international border. Sometimes they go to a country where they themselves are, have ties. Sometimes they just are going to a foreign country, often Mexico, for example, because it's, near, it's nearby, where they think that they can hide and uh, make it hard for the left-behind parent to locate them and recover the children. So our diplomats at, at our embassies and our folks based here in Washington will work with the country where we think the children are to locate the children and to arrange as quickly as possible to return them to where they were living. And then the court there will decide who should have custody and what the custody arrangement should be. So as you can imagine, all of these are cases that are intensely personal and painful for the families that are going through them. Even in a, a happy circumstance like an adoption, the fact that it can take a long time to arrange and there can be setbacks and, and disappointments, it's, it's uh, difficult very often for people to, uh, to understand what the process is and to, and to feel confident that they're doing everything they can do. And that's an important part of our job, is to be well informed, to be in a position to, uh, to reassure people. It's not always a matter of giving advice, you should do this or that, but you want to make sure that people know what their options are, know what to expect, and can feel that they're doing everything they possibly can to ensure a good outcome. Well, we work in every single country in the world. Uh, we have 220 diplomatic uh, posts, embassies, and consulates around the world, and we have consular officers working in all of them. Because fundamentally, the protection of American citizens is the first reason for having an embassy overseas. That there are lots of other things that we do, but that would be the, the first reason for being there. You want to be able to respond and uh, assist people in an emergency. We also respond in macro emergencies, something that's not just affecting one person or one family, but a, uh, a plane crash, for example, or some other big accident where there are multiple victims, uh, or when there's a, a tsunami, a, any kind of a big natural disaster, uh, political crises can strand people and close airports and people aren't sure when, when or how they'll be able to leave. Right now we're working with uh, the Ebola crisis, which has directly affected relatively few American citizens at this point. But there are many Americans who are affected in the sense that they can't plan their travel with as much confidence. You can't be sure that you'll be able to travel from one country to another, that that border won't close or flights might be rerouted uh, for a time. So trying to make sure that the information that we're giving stays up to date and that we give people everything that we can to help them make smart decisions. That's really the goal. If American diplomats weren't there to provide this kind of service, it would mean that uh, American citizens who are arrested overseas would have to figure out for themselves how to find a lawyer, how to understand what the legal process is, how to communicate with their family to let them know what, where they were and what was happening. Um, people who were, uh, were hospitalized um, might have considerably more difficulty trying to find someone who could put the doctor who's treating them in touch with their own doctor back home in order to provide background on their medical situation. There are, uh, there are often times where people may be uh, caught up in something that is political in nature. Perhaps somebody has been detained by a foreign government really for a political reason more than because of being charged with what we would think of as a crime and we would obviously be engaged in those situations too. And if you didn't have a government there to look out for you, then the one risk that you face is that you may be treated differently, and potentially worse, than a local citizen accused of the same behavior would be treated. 
So we want to make sure that we're looking out for the interests of American citizens and that we help to equip them to deal with the situation that they're in as well as they'd be able to deal with it if they were on more familiar ground. I think a lot of people don't even know that consular services exist. A lot of people don't realize how much we are able to do to assist Americans who are living overseas. Some, some of them live there permanently, some might be there for an extended period as students or for other reasons, and some are just traveling through. But all of them from time to time may need our help. And often they might need our help for very routine things like renewing an expiring passport or uh, registering and, and arranging to get your ballot in an, in an election. <clears throat> so there are, um, sometimes people overestimate what we're able to do for them. For example, someone who's arrested may think that the embassy's job is to get him out of jail. In fact, the embassy's job is to make sure that he's not being abused in jail, if, uh, to the extent that we can uh, ensure that. And to, uh, to make sure that the person is being treated the way a local citizen would be treated if arrested and charged with the same crime. But the actual process of determining whether the person is guilty and whether he's going to have to serve time in jail, that's all up to the local law enforcement system and the judicial system. That's not something that a foreign embassy can interfere with. We don't know for sure how many live abroad and how many are traveling abroad because there is no requirement for citizens to register with the U.S. Embassy and to state that they're there. So uh, we, we have estimates and we use, uh, we use those estimates to figure out what steps we would take in the event of a crisis if we needed to evacuate an area. For planning purposes, we want to have some idea of how many Americans we think might be there. So uh, just very roughly, we think that there are probably six million Americans who are overseas residing and then more still who are traveling at any given time. An important element of having a professional foreign service is that the specific standards were being set as to who was going to be eligible to come in and serve. And Perhaps there would be more of an expectation as well that this was going to be something someone would do as a career. It wouldn't be something that you did for a few years and then you go off and do something else. There's a place for uh, an element of that in our diplomacy, but you wouldn't want the whole diplomatic core to be short term. And so having a professional foreign service, it led to uh, more of a, an a, attempt to broaden the, the types of people who were representing the United States overseas. Instead of it being self-selected and to some degree uh, people who perhaps were financially able to cover their own expenses while they were overseas, you started to see people coming in based on having passed an exam and having been recruited for their specific skills, language and others. And people who had made a commitment that they were going to serve in one country after another uh, across a, a career of 20 or more years. Well, I think I could give, uh, using some of the consular work that we do is, a, is one way to describe how that is done. About 95% of the people who come to a U.S. Embassy are on their way to the consular section. So we see a lot of people uh, every day. In some places, we, we might see hundreds or thousands of visitors every day. Many of them are coming in to apply for a visa to visit the United States or an immigrant visa to move to the United States permanently. And that for, for us, there's a, a process for that. There's a routine to it. We are seeing hundreds of people a day, day after day. But for the individual who's coming in, that's his visa interview and, and it's her opportunity to apply and hopefully to be able to travel to the United States for whatever it is that they've got planned. And it's very personal. 
the questions that we ask about where do you work and how long have you worked there and uh, what, are, what is your plan for going to the United States? What do you expect to do while you're there? How long will you stay? How will you pay for it? Those are all personal. And the interview itself is face to face. And when we make our determination as to whether the person qualifies for the visa, normally it takes place right then and there. Well, at the end of a few minutes of, of interview, and based on that, plus other information that we have from their application, we're going to say the visa is approved and you should have your passport back within a few days, or I'm sorry, you don't qualify for a visa at this time and I'm not going to be able to approve it. But we're saying that face to face. It's not like you get a letter in the mail and, and it says, you know, you haven't been accepted at the college you were hoping to go to or you didn't get a part in the play. It's me directly telling somebody that I'm not going to let them travel to my country. And it's so important that that message be delivered in a way that makes it clear that the decision is based on the law and on factors and we, we try to briefly explain what the issue is. And we often are able to explain that whatever that issue is, is one that would not prevent the person from qualifying if they were to apply again in a few years. So we're not saying you'll never be able to go. So whether or not the applicants get the answer they're hoping to hear, that our job is to make sure that their visit to the office is one where they're treated efficiently and respectfully, and they have a chance and this is getting back uh, to the question about how we convey U.S. values in the work that we do. We should be able to convey good humor and friendliness and uh, along with the professionalism that's part of the, the work that we're doing. So that is something that stays with people whether or not they actually are able to get the visa that, that they're the, they, they remember the questions we ask, they remember the expressions on our faces, they remember how, uh, how they were treated by the guards when they were waiting in line outside. All of that has a tremendous impact on that person's impression of the United States and what we think of his country, what we think of his culture. My experience has been that people who have applied for a U.S. visa, whether or not they got the visa, uh, they remember in detail the experience of that first application because they come in anticipating that it's going to be difficult and that they might get refused and they don't know what to expect or what we might ask. So there, it's, it's hard to overestimate how important it is for us to convey in the course of those routine visa applications the the values that are very American, of being treating people with respect, operating in a way that is efficient and respects their time, trying to be as transparent as we can so people can arrive well prepared for the, for the interview, and whether or not we're able to approve the visa or the other service that they came in for, to convey our sense that, that they are, uh, that we would have approved it if we could. Uh, that it, it's often a matter of law and not something that is somehow personal to them and to leave them with a sense that uh, they, uh, they were treated with respect by, uh, by the United States because that's who we're representing. That's what people are going to be thinking about when they walk away is the United States said or did the following things. There are so many people that you think of when you, when you think back over the years, the different uh, places that you served and so forth. Uh, one, one tour that, that will always be an important one for me and for my husband, who's also uh, now retired Foreign Service, but we were fortunate enough to serve in Czechoslovakia during the last two years of communism and the first year of democracy. So we were there for that revolution. And during the period when it was still a communist country, uh, very much controlled by the Soviet Union. Uh, they didn't know, and we didn't know, that that was likely to change anytime soon. It wasn't something that you could see coming. And we did a lot of work with 
the dissidents, the people who were on record in Czechoslovakia as, as speaking out in favor of uh, more freedom, complete freedom for their people. And that was a, a real privilege for us to be able to engage with uh, these folks who were really courageous. They were not putting just their own lives and careers on the line. They often served time in prison and they were they were professionals. They were journalists and playwrights and musicians and they weren't allowed to practice their professions. But their children were also prevented from going very far in school. They weren't allowed to get into any kind of a good professional job. So making that decision meant that you were making a decision for your own children that their futures would be limited as well. Very few people had the courage to do that. And I remember there was one person that I got to know. He, he came into the embassy hoping that we would be able to assist him. And he had a problem that we really couldn't assist with. His, his wife had traveled abroad and then stayed. He knew she was going to do that. And uh, now he was hoping that he would be able to find a way to, to leave too and to join her. And he, I think, was probably hoping that we would somehow smuggle him out in, in the trunk of somebody's car. We couldn't do that. But, uh, but I did get to know him. Uh, he came by from time to time. Uh, often he wouldn't come to the embassy because, of course, they were watching uh, and they would, they would know. And so uh, we would arrange to just meet and walk along the street and talk at some place where there was less chance that he would be obviously identified as communicating with the embassy. And I met periodically as part of my job with uh, a senior consular officer in the Czech government. And one of the things that we talked about was I would bring to his attention the cases of Czechs who had spouses in the States that they wanted to join. All of them were women, except for this one man whose, whose wife was in the United States. And I did mention one day, I said, you know, we have these cases, we've discussed them before, and they're all important. Uh, but it, it's interesting to note that there's really only one man on the list, and I think you should perhaps consider how it would be for you if, if your wife were uh, in, a, in another country and you've been separated for some years, you'd like to be able to join her. And a couple of months later, they let him go. Now, I don't know whether that had anything to do with my comment or touching a chord or whether it was just a, you know, a coincidence, but uh, I had the opportunity then to meet him and his wife much later after we left Prague. They were living in Baltimore, and my husband and I went out. It, it just brought home the fact that the, these aren't cases that we're working on. These are real people with, uh, with dreams, with uh, aspirations. To, that are not political, but they can, they can be caught up in political circumstances. And sometimes it's people with political connections, if you will, people with official standing who are in a position to, to try to help, to try to push. And that is very much behind the role of any diplomat, is to look for ways to use the access that you have as a representative of the United States government and the connections that you make, the people that you get to meet, to push forward in, in small ways and larger ways the, uh, the, the problems of individuals who have come to you and are hoping that you might be able to find a way to unlock that problem and, and help them to move forward. Some of the sacrifices that you make are ones that you know about going in. You know that you're going to be serving overseas, and that means uh, less time with family members back home. It means that your children grow up with some remarkable opportunities and experiences, but they don't grow up knowing their cousins. And uh, so some of those things I think you need to think about and try to consider how you can compensate for that in different ways. Uh, my husband served as ambassador in Bosnia at a time when he had really a rugby team of bodyguards that went with him everywhere. And uh, that, that was, uh, they, they kept him very safe. He never was uh, attacked in any way. But it, it changes the way you're thinking when you have to be uh, living in a way where everything that you do has to be planned in advance. I had bodyguards in, in one tour. And uh, you, you can't walk the dog unless the guys are there. You know? and, and so it's everything that you do has to be considered. 
I, I can say honestly that for me the, the trade-offs were all ones that I was happy to make. That I, I think I uh, got far more out of the privilege of serving overseas, representing the United States overseas, than the, the costs to us or to our children who had to make a lot of adjustments. Children are the ultimate conservatives. They don't want to change the house they live in or the school they go to or the friends they have. And so knowing that you're going to move every three years is a strain for kids. They, they, it affects how they make friends because they, they think about how much to invest in that friendship if they know they're going to have to say goodbye. And so that was something also that you have to be thinking about as a mother then and how to help your children uh, develop and foster the right attitude toward friendships and toward connections and commitments. Some of that is easier now when people can stay in touch with Skype and other things and that wasn't possible when my children were little. But uh, the, I think whatever profession you choose there are going to be uh, costs and benefits and it's important to be clear-eyed about what those are and think about ways that you can uh, minimize the the expense, if you will, of the cost. When I came into the Foreign Service in 1977, it was still relatively uh, uncommon. I certainly wasn't a, a trailblazer, but uh, it was relatively uncommon for women to be Foreign Service officers, and then uh, for married women to be Foreign Service officers. And so it wasn't unusual to run into people who weren't sure you'd be able to do it because they hadn't seen it done. Uh, but I, there were very few circumstances when I ran into active opposition, where I ran into people who were actually trying to build a brick wall that would keep me from going forward. And that includes also the people that I dealt with in foreign governments, because people would often say, you know, they're not the problem, your colleagues, but uh, the, the officials in this country won't want to deal with a woman. And I simply did not find that to be the case in, in any circumstances. You have to come in well prepared, you have to come in ready to discuss the issue that you're there to discuss, and you have to follow up on the commitments that you make. If you promise to find something out or get back to them, you make sure you do that. But that would be true of any professional, it would be true of any diplomat. And so I, I think the, uh, whatever concerns I had going in, uh, based on what people were cautioning me I might not be able to do, proved not to be the case at all. And I, it, there were times when it was an advantage to be who I was because people remembered me. And uh, that you just you build on whatever uh, strengths and advantages you have and you move forward. Well, there are many challenges that we face. Uh, a big advantage that we have is that we have a lot of experience now and a good foundation to build on. For diplomacy going forward, one real challenge, one thing that you certainly see as a difference if you look at what we're doing today compared to 20 years ago, is that many more of our tours are in places that are actively, explicitly dangerous for foreign diplomats and, and for American diplomats. And so people who are in the Foreign Service can anticipate spending more of their careers in places where they are uh, traveling everywhere in armored cars with, uh, with protection, where they may not be able to have their families join them for that tour. Uh, that, that's a, a change. We, we work much more closely now with, as, a, as an interagency operation, I would say, compared to 20 or 25 or 30 years ago. That's a plus. The, the fact that we're working much more closely with other branches of our own government and with uh, multilateral organizations like the UN and so forth, uh, that's possible because communication is much faster now and much more comprehensive than it used to be. And it means that we're able to bring resources to bear. You're not dependent just on what the State Department knows and can do and so forth. You, you really do have the resources of DHS and Justice and the Treasury Department and others. So going forward, I think some of our challenges are that we face 
a large and complex problems involving actors who are not governments, who are not states. As far as consular affairs goes, we definitely, one challenge we face is a significant growth in demand for our services. The demand for visas, the interest in traveling to the United States is, is climbing in some countries 30% a year, year on year. Uh, it's hard to keep up with that growth. We have a critically important responsibility to ensure that we are screening these applicants so that those who are criminals or terrorists or have the intent to do harm to the United States don't get a visa, don't get the ability to travel to the United States. And at the same time, we have a responsibility to efficiently uh, adjudicate the applications of the vast majority of applicants who are coming here for good reasons and whose uh, money is vitally important to the U.S. economy. So that's an important national security role, and the volume of demand is one that's going to be uh, a challenge to manage and to address. Indeed, the, the tour that I had in Lesotho, uh, which was my only uh, assignment in Africa, was one where public health issues were a very important part of our agenda. The, uh, the, some of those issues involved HIV AIDS and uh, tuberculosis, but uh, malnutrition among the, uh, the local population, especially affecting small children, was another really important issue. So some of the, the things that we could do as foreign diplomats had to do with of course, there were government programs where we were helping to train doctors and nurses and providing supplies and that kind of thing. But we also had the ability to speak out about stigma, for example. And uh, there, were, there was a campaign underway to promote uh, male circumcision because that was medical male circumcision was one way to prevent the spread of HIV. Uh, so speaking out about the importance of that was, was something that, uh, that helped in the sense that I was in a culture where people didn't think that you should even discuss it, didn't think that it should be mentioned. And, and if you are talking about it openly, that helps to break down that taboo. So uh, there, are, there are a lot of very important things that, that we do as a government across the world to encourage vaccination of children, to encourage uh, the dissemination of good information to mothers about how to give their children a good diet, uh, using some of the traditional things that they grew up eating, but expanding on that so the children are getting a better range of nutrients. And so there are, uh, by, by visiting schools, by visiting clinics, by recognizing organizations that are doing good work and helping to give them more visibility. You can use the access and the visibility you have as a person with a title and as a foreigner and as an American to, to promote some things that are critically important to the people living in that country. Oh, the, the work of the, uh, the consular officers is critical to U.S. economic interests. There are hundreds of thousands of uh, foreign students who study in the United States, and it's our job to assess their applications and confirm that they are indeed legitimate students and that they have the funds to pay for their studies. They're not coming here to work illegally. Uh, but those, uh, those students pay their own way, typically, and so they're very important to a lot of the schools that they attend. But they also enrich the, the lives of all of the students who attend those schools. By being in those classrooms and in those dormitories, American students who may never have traveled to Asia or to Africa or where, wherever it may be, will have a chance to learn about that culture and to uh, learn about the, the traditions of, and, and the worldview of the people who live there. So it's a great and enriching experience, of course, for the foreign students who also go back to their own countries then and are, uh, you know, feel a connection to America that is lifelong. They, it's a place they've lived. It's a place where they have friends. And so 
just as my family feels a special connection to each of the countries where we've had the opportunity to serve as diplomats, the foreign students and other foreigners who come to the United States get to know Americans in a way that is much more rich and nuanced than it would be if they just depended on what they hear about the United States in their own country. But the international travel for business, for tourism, it generates $181 billion a year of income for the United States and supports thousands and thousands of jobs here. So travel and tourism is one of the strongest elements, components of our economy. And we're an important part through our efficiency in responding to people who are interested in traveling to the States. We promote the idea that the States is a, an easy place to get to and a really enjoyable place to visit. Yes, the consular officers are in a position where a choke point. Anybody who wants to come to the United States is going to have to stand in front of that window and get interviewed. And so you have an opportunity there for somebody with a, a very strong uh, background in that country, in that culture, and who has, who of course, knows our laws uh, and has reviewed the application of the person who is applying to assess whether the story makes sense. Does the person who's standing in front of me, the way he talks, the way she describes her plans and so forth, does that fit the story that's being told in the application? Or is this someone who is pretending to be something that, that he or she is not? I think WikiLeaks reminded all of us that the although it's absolutely essential that we have the ability to sit down with someone and say, let's just talk confidentially. This is, you know, I'm, I'm going to report it back to my government, of course, and you'll be reporting it to yours, but this is not going to become public. But let's talk frankly about this issue and about what, what you see and what I see as potential avenues for moving forward. When that kind of thing is then released and people are publicly exposed as having perhaps criticized individuals in their government or done, done other things that, that are embarrassing for them and make them less effective in their own government. It takes time to rebuild trust uh, with, with every government then. And it's, so I think that the, the WikiLeaks events themselves were hugely damaging. Even though most of what was released showed that we're doing what you would expect us to be doing, accurately reporting developments in the countries where we're serving and assessing the, the reliability and the level of influence and so forth of the people that we were dealing with and that we were uh, reporting back about our conversations with. So the work that we were doing and that was uh, described in the cables was completely legitimate, but the fact that it was uh, made public was in many cases quite damaging. Even, even though to the outside observer it might not seem that it was such a big deal. But there are governments where it's not considered acceptable for um, the minister for agriculture to criticize his prime minister. It's just not supposed to happen. And uh, we wouldn't be surprised if our secretary of agriculture indicated some disagreement with the president on something, but that doesn't happen in other countries sometimes. And so that kind of thing uh, was made it harder for all of us to do our work because it made people feel like maybe it wasn't safe to talk to the Americans. Things might become public. My experience with the political appointees that I've worked for through the years has been uh, very positive. Many of the same things that would make you successful in business, in politics, in academia are also assets in diplomacy. The ability to connect with people, the, the ability to have a genuine interest in them and to be thinking as you're getting to know them about how you might be able to assist them in some way with the things that they're interested in. The, uh, the habit of following through on the promises that you make if you say, I, I, know, I know a program that might be of interest to you, uh, then you follow up and you send them the, inf the information about that program. You don't just forget it. 
so many of the people who are successful in private life and come into the Foreign Service as political appointees are extremely successful in diplomacy and they do a really great job. And many of them are also very good as leaders of teams and that's what an embassy is. So the, the job of the people within the embassy is to support the ambassador and to support the program of the president and whoever that ambassador is, you're going to do your best for that person. And that is that because it is that way, it usually works really very successfully. I think that the political ambassadors and the career ambassadors that I've worked with, both at posts overseas and in uh, different jobs here in Washington, that have both brought real strengths to the jobs that they took on. Not in establishing it. Not in establishing it? No. The, there was a big PEPFAR program in Lesotho when I was the ambassador there. And I helped to promote and to uh, put out the word about all that we were doing in PEPFAR. And I, I happened to be serving in a country where the fact that the United States government was engaged and was assisting on those health issues and on other issues was broadly recognized and appreciated. So I wasn't trying to uh, dispel any misconceptions about the United States. People appreciated the fact that we were there and all that we were doing. But my participation at events could sometimes raise the level of attention that it got in the press or you know, help people to notice that, uh, that a, another milestone had been reached. I think that we would see the benefit a thousand times over of increased investment in diplomacy. So the, the kinds of things that we're able to do overseas work to the advantage of the United States in innumerable ways. The, the impact that we have on the, the audiences that we're able to reach the programs that we're able to undertake in, in uh, coordination with local folks. If we, were, if we had the funding to do more of that, there's no question that the, the benefits would be enormous for the United States. As far as the consular work goes, the work that we do is funded by visa fees. So it's not taxpayer dollars that, that pay for that consular work, it's the, v, the fees that we collect for the services that we provide, which then underwrite the costs of providing those services. There was somebody that I remember, this was in Czechoslovakia, and it was after the revolution. So people were coming in to apply for visas because now they actually had the ability to travel if they wanted to, which had been forbidden when it was uh, still a controlled communist country. And a man came in to apply who happened to have been born two days before my mother. So, you know, I, I was imagining as I talked to him, you know, his, his growing up and my mother's growing up in, through the same years and so forth. And his children, he had three children like my mother, but they were all about 10 years younger than my brothers and me because he had spent 10 years in jail. And we needed to go into that in detail because uh, one of the things that will prevent you from getting a U.S. visa is if you've been convicted of a crime and spent a certain number of years in prison. So I needed to know what he was convicted of. And it turned out that he had been uh, sent to jail for 10 years because of a connection to Boy Scouts. Uh, somebody, I think he had actually been engaged with Boy Scouts before 1948, before the communists took over. But someone had put some information about it into his mailbox. He didn't report that, as under those, that regime you had to, but a neighbor reported him, and he was sent to jail. So then we had to go through a process where I wrote it up and made the case that this was political, this wasn't a felony, that he should still qualify. And, but I, I had multiple opportunities to talk to him while we were waiting for clearance to come back from Washington. And so I just, again, I remember thinking about his life uh, compared to somebody that I knew very well who had lived through the same years and the kinds of pressure that people were under, the, 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 the fact that he was delayed all that time. He, he wasn't able to marry and start his family until after he'd already gotten out of prison 
and then, you know, for years, raised his children under a regime where you had to be careful what the children said. If anything was going on at home that wasn't in line with the regime, you could be betrayed by an innocent child talking about someone who was over or referring to some phrase that they had heard or something that they had heard. But he's one of the people that I'll always remember as a, as a personal example of how lives were deformed by the political system that they had to cope with.